Before I start, um, I want to say that I am by nature one of the world's fast talkers, and I know that that can be difficult when someone's speaking not in your native language. Most of my time in Switzerland to date has been spent in Geneva at uh, WIPO at the United Nations, where I was known as the terror of the translation court. <laughs> Many times I would speak and then turn around and see a row of translator booths and they would all be doing this. <laughs> so I want to give you permission before I start that when I start to speak too quickly to do this, and I will slow down, I promise. Um, thank you all for coming tonight on this rainy, cold, Christmassy sort of evening. And thank you especially to the organizers for putting this together. It was very, very kind of them. And I hope that you will um, find yourself more involved with the institutions they represent. So I want to talk tonight about copyright, obviously. And I want to start talking about copyright in a way that I hope will be more constructive than the way that we've conducted the discussion to date over the last 15 years or so. Um, copyright's important. It's important to me. Uh, we're a single income family these days. My wife quit her job recently to start a business, so our income comes from copyright. And um, I'm not opposed to copyright, but I think that it needs some fixing. But I think whenever we talk about copyright, we get bogged down in this silly and polarized debate that goes, copyright is bad. No, copyright is good. That's silly, because copyright, in my view, is just the rules that governs the industry uh, that produces entertainment products. It's just a set of supply chain regulations. And uh, complex industries should have good regulations. Um, I kind of wish finance had better regulations. Um, and arguing about whether having regulations is, uh, is a good idea is just silly. Instead, I think what we need to argue about is which rules do we want? Which rules are best? Because everyone knows that the proposition that uh, no rules would be good, taking away all rules is always better, is ridiculous. And so when people say, oh, you want to get rid of some of the rules, therefore you don't want any rules, they're being intellectually dishonest. It's a cheap debating trick. Reasonable people might disagree about whether the motorway's top speed should be 120 kilometers an hour, 90 kilometers an hour, or 40 km 140 kilometers an hour. But saying that you want a, small, a lower or higher speed limit is not the same as saying you want no speed limits at all. Likewise, it's ridiculous to say more rules always improve things. If they put a stop sign on every corner in your neighborhood and you realize that the traffic flows quite nicely, it doesn't follow that adding another stop sign between each stop sign would make the traffic flow even better. So tonight I want to talk about which rules we should have, not whether to take away or add rules. Here in the digital age, everything we do involves copies. Millions of copies, billions of copies. Collectively, the people in this room have probably made more copies in their lives than the whole human race made up to the time the first non-literary copyrights came in at the turn of the 20th century with phonograms. We copy like we breathe in the digital age, and so the stakes for getting things right on copyright have never been higher. So we'll get beyond copyright is good or copyright is bad and dig into meatier questions like what do we want copyright to do and which copyright will do it. Let's start with something that most people I think agree with. A good copyright system serves as an incentive to creativity. A good copyright system results in more people making more creations. One of the important goals of copyright is serving creators. Now, 15 years ago, the world's governments started looking at modernizing copyrights, bringing them into the digital age. Pretty much the first order of business was to create new copyright laws regarding technologies that stop copying digital rights management technology, or TPMs, or digital logs, depending on where you are. Um, WIPO, of course, is the UN agency uh, here in Switzerland, in Geneva, that's responsible for the world's copyright treaties. I sometimes say it has the same relationship to the world's ridiculous copyright laws that Mordor has to evil. <laughs> and in 1996, thanks 
primarily to American lobbying, we got the White Bow Copyright Treaty, or WCT, that created a regime of legal protection for digital rights management, for digital logs. Um, in the US, it became the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA, of 1998, very notorious law that those of you who read American technology websites will have heard of. And in Europe, it became the EUCD in the early part of this century. But the EUCD and the DMCA don't just do what White Post Treaty demands, which is to make it a separate offense to break a log in order to infringe copyright. They actually make it illegal to break logs. They make it illegal to break locks, even if you're doing so for a purpose that would otherwise be lawful. Even if you're breaking the lock off of something that belongs to you. Um, well, what does that mean? Well, if you're a so-called user of a creative work, this means that there's a lot of things that the law might allow, uh, format shifting, time shifting, copying for parody or classroom instruction or archiving, that suddenly become illegal, not because the law changed, but because digital rights management has been deployed, and in order to accomplish these lawful ends, you would have to remove the digital rights management, and that itself is illegal. But um, the most voracious consumers of creative works are creators. Uh, we make new things by looking at old things and finding new ways of rubbing them together. There's a reason that the dust jacket photo for many authors if it's not the writer standing on a lonely cliff looking at the horizon, it's usually the writer standing in front of a wall of books because you make new books by reading old books. But for creators and publishers, there was a secondary effect of creating this regime that was much subtler and ultimately more drastic in the way that it affected the business of creativity. What this regime did was, met, was, was created a world where DRM companies have more of a say over our works than we do. So for example, look at the iTunes store, which has a mandatory DRM policy for videos and audiobooks. Even if the rights holder doesn't want DRM, Apple insists and requires it for audiobooks and, and videos. So if you go out there and sell a million euros or francs or dollars worth of audiobooks on iTunes, which controls 90% of the audiobook market, and then afterwards you say, you know, there's someone out there who's about to do to iTunes what iTunes did to all those crappy music stores when it started. It's about to completely obliterate it, and it's going to give me a better deal. It's going to give me, uh, instead of taking 30%, it'll take 15%. If you want to switch to that new store, you have to rely on your audience being willing to either maintain two separate non-interoperable collections, as though the books you bought from one store could only be shelved in one room on an Ikea bookcase, and the books you bought from another store could only be shelved on a different bookcase made by a different manufacturer in a different room. Or you have to face the fact that you're going to lose those customers. Um, and since no one wants to do that, no one wants to write off the next million dollars worth of business, we end up staying with companies that may not be the best companies to sell our products. So now you've got these three important entities in the value chain of the entertainment industry. The person who wrote the book, the company that invested in the audio edition, and the company that contributed no creative labor to the book. They did, however, manufacture a skinny piece of electronics in South China, and then load the book onto that piece of electronics. So who should get the lion's share of the copyright protection here? Who should be allowed to say, yes, you are allowed to copy this file made up of precious, expensive to produce creative bits? Well, in practice, it turns out not to be the creator and not to be the investor. It turns out to be the DRM vendor. And of course, this is even worse for companies that do video that is episodic or runs in a series because no one wants to have episodes one through seven in this library and eight through 14 in that library. So once you start selling, into a format, you get very strongly locked into it unless you can authorize your audience to move it from one format to another. So this becomes copyright not as a friend to the creator, but copyright as a friend to platform owners, to would-be monopolists. The funny thing is that it wouldn't be hard to write DRM rules that say uh, it's illegal to break DRM, to break copyright, and otherwise it's not. 
You just write a law that says it's illegal to break DRM, to break copyright. Otherwise, it's not. And not the half-assed version that says, oh, you can break DRM to break copyright, but no one's allowed to give you the tools to break DRM, and no one's allowed to sell the tools to break DRM, and no one's allowed to make a device that does something lawful that involves breaking DRM or a service that does it. But if you yourself, laboring in obscurity in your attic, can figure out how to break the DRM, it's not illegal. Um, because otherwise, what this law says is if your DRM locks up a use that's legal or illegal, that's up or down, left or right, the government will spend as much tax money as it takes to make sure that no one breaks it. What company wouldn't take up a government on a sweet offer like that? Some companies have figured out how to play this like virtuosos. The entire Apple iOS ecosystem is a kind of exhibit A of every way that DRM laws can go wrong. So Apple uses DRM to ensure that only apps bought from Apple can run on the, uh, the Touch, the iPad, and the iPhone. It means that if you make a program for iOS and I want to buy your program for iOS, I have to break DRM to buy it from you and install it unless Apple puts it in the App Store. And Apple takes 30% off the top of App Store sales. If Apple doesn't like your app, they won't sell it, which is their right and privilege. When I was a bookstore, uh, when I worked in a bookstore, there were books I didn't like, and we didn't sell them. There's an important difference. Having bought a bookcase, you could put anyone's books in it. You didn't have to buy them from the store I worked at. Um, you are, as a vendor of multimedia or interactive media or media that is sold through the App Store, locked into that platform, and you can't authorize your audience to take your apps and run them in an emulator somewhere else, or to take apps that you've made somewhere else and run them on their devices. Now, the more popular that Apple has gotten, the worse the deal for the creators that supply it has gotten. Now that Apple has established itself as the powerhouse distributor for interactive media, it's decided that in addition to the 30% commission it gets when you sell software through it, it wants 30% of all the money that that software generates forever. If you sell a product that allows you to read a magazine, and then subsequently that magazine has things you can click on to buy stuff, Apple wants 30% of those purchases too. There has never been a time when tight controls over distribution benefited artists. Fewer labels always meant worse deals for musicians. Fewer studios always meant worse deals for filmmakers and people in the film industry. Um, fewer publishers always mean worse deals for writers. And it's no different with the distribution bottlenecks created by DRM laws and handed to companies like Apple and its competitors. Now you think that 15 years after the US got it so wrong that other governments would be lining up to get it right, but you'd be wrong. All over the world, countries continue to enact these special protections for digital locks that go beyond the WIPO Copyright Treaty and, and give um, power to DRM vendors at the expense of creators. For example, the Canadian majority, majority conservative government is poised to pass Bill C-11, which does this, without any further consultation even though the initial consultation said that Canadians rejected this, as did everyone from archivists to music labels to musicians to filmmakers, uh, and even though they've admitted that they know that the Canadian people don't want it. And in the UK, our regulator, I live in London, our regulator of uh, broadcasts, Ofcom, sold out the British public interest and told the BBC that they could have digital rights management on our public television that we are required to pay for through a license fee that you have to pay everyone who owns a television, has to pay 120 pounds a year to fund the BBC, but they're gonna add DRM to the broadcast that we're paying for. They did this at the behest of US broadcasters like Fox and Warner and Sony. Uh, those companies are not allowed DRM at home. The American government has said that they can put DRM on their broadcasts in America, but they're, they're seeking it and they've gotten it in the UK and they're seeking it in other European countries as well. Ofcom kept the BBC's submission, in which they detailed the, the most uh, sinister parts of this plan, a secret, and refused to release it under freedom of information requests, because they said it was commercially sensitive. Um, and the DRM that they've plumped for 
uh, is one that's controlled by Intel, and the implementation details of it are a secret that you can only be privy to if you sign a non-disclosure agreement. So we now have a law that you can only follow if you sign a non-disclosure agreement with an American company and then never tell anyone what the law says. Now, I leaked the details of this BBC memo in The Guardian a little while ago, and it remains to be seen whether that's going to have any effect on this, but it sure galls me. More, making a mistake about the way that digital copyright should work in 1998 is barely forgivable. After all, it was hard to see how things would go then. We thought virtual reality would be cool. But more than a decade later, with all the facts in hand about what happened with these laws, it's inexcusable to repeat their mistakes. And worst of all, when these laws are proposed, some of their strongest proponents are creators and studios, labels and publishers, uh, who endorse the plan to give control of their business over to DRM vendors. It's a kind of suicide by law. It's not as though digital rights management will actually solve the problems that they have with copying. Um, after all, when they update the DRM on uh, Apple's iOS products, it's usually broken in a day. Um, and what could be a bigger joke than DRM on eBooks? I mean, it's like publishers think that we don't have typists anymore. Like we don't live in the golden era of typists. There's never been a time in the history of the human race where more people knew how to retype a book that's been locked up. Now, why doesn't DRM work? Well, it's not because of typists, really. It's because for DRM to work, you have to have a device that can successfully resist the commands given to it by its owner. That is, you have to design a general purpose computer that runs every program except for the program that pisses you off. <laughs> and we don't know how to do that. To make DRM work, you have to make sure that the smartest person in the world can't break it. Because, because once she does that, it's broken for everyone. Because either the crack appears on the net, you can download it and apply it to your device. Or the file is broken, and it appears on the net. And then all you need to do to be an elite hacker is sit down and type Bit to, BitTorrent Toy Story 3 into Google. <laughs> real security experts and real cryptographers who don't work for DRM companies will tell you that DRM is impossible. You just can't design a security system that never leaks, that can't be patched, and that attempts to hide its secrets in equipment that you then give over to the most resourced attackers in the world, people who have access to any equipment that they could conceivably need to extract those secrets. Entertainment companies may be naive enough to be convinced that there's hope for DRM, but they're wrong. And when they're fooled into endorsing these DRM proposals, they stab themselves in the back by creating a marketplace where DRM vendors hold all the cards, and the only way to get the fully functional, pristine copy of their works that we all want when we take our money out of our wallet is to steal it. Because if you buy it, you get a crippled computer that tries to control its owner. I, I call this very grandiosely uh, Dr. O's first law, and it goes like this. Uh, anytime someone puts a lock on something that belongs to you, but won't give you the key, that lock isn't there for your benefit. I mean, it seems simple to me. <laughs> now, you'll notice that I call that Dr. O's first law, which implies that there might be others. There are. Um, at first, it was just Dr. O's law. And I told my agent about it. My agent used to be Arthur C. Clarke's agent. Now he's the uh, agent of the estate of Arthur C. Clarke. And he said, you can't have one law. You need three. <laughs> so I have three laws. That's what the rest of this talk will be. It'll be the other two laws. So here's my second law. Fame won't guarantee fortune, but no one in the arts ever made money by being unknown. It's an important corollary to this DRM doesn't work stuff. Because, of course, the internet's a copying machine. Computers are copying machines. A bit that can't be copied is like water that isn't wet. And um, we talk about reading and writing bits, but you can't read a bit, you copy a bit. When you read a bit from a drive, you copy it from the drive into memory, you copy it from memory into a frame buffer, you copy it from the frame buffer onto the screen. Which means that if people love your stuff, they'll copy it. Now, Tim O'Reilly is a very clever person when it comes to technology, and he said many famous things, but one of my favorites is this thing he said, for most artists, the problem isn't piracy, it's obscurity. 
And that's a good thing for him to have said, but I think when people hear it, they think that what he means is, if you are famous enough, you'll be rich. And of course, that's not true. There are lots of people who've been made famous without ever being made rich. The entertainment world is full of people who can tell you stories about how widely their movies or games or books or songs were copied, and that they never saw any money at all from this exposure. And fame is nice, but you can't eat it, you can't use it to pay your kids' dentist bills, and you can't use it to ride the metro. So there are plenty of people for whom fame has brought nothing. But there is an important thing to note about fame. Everyone who attains commercial success has it in some measure in the commercial, in the creative fields. It's a contradiction in terms to be both unknown and a commercially successful artist. Creative fame may not make you rich, but you won't make any money without it. People who might love your, if the people who might love your stuff don't know it exists, they can't give you money for it. Of course, they still might not pay you for it once they know it exists. But before people can pay for it, they have to know it's there. Now, there are way, lots of ways to turn fame into money, and they're as old as the arts themselves. You can sell things. You can ask for donations. You can perform. You can wrap your works with advertising. You can license your works to other people who are creating things that they figured out how to make money off of. Or you can take commissions. But you can't do any of that stuff unless people care about your work. Now, lucky for us, we have the internet, which is, uh, in addition to being a copying machine, is a machine for making people care about your work. It's an audience machine. Because it's never been easier to put a work into the hands of someone who might want it. It's never been easier to be distributed. Getting paid is still hard, and it's always been hard and probably will be hard forever. But look at how things have changed in the world of video games. Once, a games vendor would have to sink a fortune into creating cartridges, and then would have to find a way to get them into two or three big box stores. Now we can sell games directly to browsers, to consoles, tablets, and phones. And we can use anything from a DIY shopping cart with PayPal on the back end, all the way up to sophisticated systems like Steam to collect the money for it. Or think of what's happened to movies. The old days you had a theatrical release window that was very narrow, a limited number of screens, a few nati national broadcasters, and a few major DVD vendors. And now we have an infinitude of ways to deliver video to people who want to watch it. Figuring out how to get people to care enough about your stuff to download it is still a hard problem. It's always been a hard problem. But things like Blogger and Twitter and Facebook and all the other services that allow audiences and creators to connect are making it a little easier, as does low-cost, easy copying. Copying solves the getting your work to the audience problem. You can stick your video on YouTube or Vimeo or archive.org. You can stick your ebook in the Kindle store or put it on Smashwords or put a donate button on your website. Games, photos, even 3D meshes. There are more easy to search, easy to enter distribution channels than ever before, which means that there are more creators who can get their works into the hands of people who want them and might pay for them. But this is only possible because the intermediaries, YouTube, Vimeo, Amazon, the Internet Archive, Blogger, WordPress, Thingiverse, Rackspace, and the ISP on the corner are not required to act as police. They're not required to watch for bad content and inspect everything that gets uploaded before it goes live. It's inconceivable that our intermediaries could do it. Imagine if YouTube, to name just one service, had to get a lawyer's permission before each video went live. They're getting 50, 60 hours worth of video every minute. There aren't enough lawyer hours remaining between now and the heat death of the universe to make a dent in this video. But all over the world, entertainment companies and their friends in government are trying to pass laws that make intermediaries responsible for what we do when we use them. They're saying that countries should follow the example set by Saudi Arabia and China and build national firewalls and then use them to block sites that are, quote, used by pirates. Because sites that are used by pirates should have the duty to police their users and make sure that they kill anything that infringes copyright. And otherwise, they should disappear from the internet. But sites used by pirates is just another way of saying sites used by everyone. Because there are no files indexed on the Pirate Bay that are not indexed on Google or Bing. You might be an independent auteur filmmaker 
and know how to make a fantastic film in your garage, but it doesn't follow that you also know how to invent YouTube and run it successfully. The Venn diagram of all the companies that have a great idea for a video game and all the companies that can operate Amazon's cloud service to host it has a very, very small intersection. We need intermediaries who can provide the plumbing, the boring commodity, storage, and service through which our works flow and on which they run, because without them, we creators end up having to bear those costs, and most of us can't do it. All of these services are under attack today. Laws like the proposed American Stop Online Piracy Act, the UK Digital Economy Act, the internet and international agreements like the Korea-US Free Trade Pact, the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement to which Switzerland is a party, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership all increase the liability for intermediaries. Ironically, the thing, one of the things that um, intermediaries are under attack for is allowing files to be flagged as private. So, for example, file lockers are face attack because one of the things you can do with a file locker is say, I'm putting this file there and the only people who are allowed to see it are people I give the password to. And many entertainment giants say, well, yes, but this means that we can't inspect all the files on the file locker and make sure they don't infringe our copyright, and some of them undoubtedly do. But one of the most prolific users of file lockers is creators, because no substantial creative work can be made without exchanging big files. Big files used to be hard. Then file lockers came along. Now big files are easy. If we had to make every big file we sent in the process of creating something public, we'd be doomed. You don't want your gold masters to be public. You don't want your working files to be public. You want to be able to finish the work before you make it public. Now, you may think that American legislative fights are relevant to Switzerland, uh, but American law reaches its tentacles over the whole internet for many reasons. First, because .com and .net domains are directly vulnerable to the US State Department, which has recently made a practice of seizing them from overseas websites, including European websites, including European websites that have been found to be legal without any judicial proceedings as a kind of ad hoc, we don't like it, make it go away, go away basis. Um, second, because the US exerts extraordinary pressure on its trading partners to adopt not just its laws, but laws that are more extreme than its laws. The Canadian C-11 bill that I mentioned actually is missing some of the important escape valves in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, the only major stakeholders that the Canadian copyright uh, minister and ministry met with were American entertainment companies. They refused to meet with the Canadian equivalents. So we have to assume that this came from the American trade representatives uh, and the uh, American lobbies. And the American, one of the great American exports isn't just entertainment products, it's entertainment lobbyists. So that some of the strongest lobbies in the EU and around the world come from the Business Software Alliance, the Motion Picture Association, the IFPI, and the Entertainment Software Alliance. Let me talk for a moment about the current American legislative madness, SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act. It's been called the worst internet law in American legislative history, and it's on a fast track to pass before Christmas with its next reading on December the 15th. The hearings on SOPA only invited proponents of the bill, with the exception of Google, who surprised us all by speaking in favor of it. SOPA claims jurisdiction over every website in the world, provided that there is at least one page that is, quote, directed at the US, and is alleged to have taken steps or to be taking steps to avoid confirming a high probability of infringement. That is to say, you've got passwords or anything else that stops them from figuring out what you're doing. Now, SOPA has several problems. First, it allows the US government to order the shutdown of sites that carry links to sites that are alleged to infringe uh, copyright. So let me unpack that. This is not about shutting down websites that infringe copyright. This is shutting down websites that link to websites that are alleged to infringe copyright. The comment on your blog that includes a link to a website that is alleged to infringe copyright is enough to put your blog in the crosshairs of this, of this um, law. Without, uh, and it, the, the shutdown is quite expansive. It, it can take the form of an order to the companies that manage major DNS servers to remove the name record that converts the name of the website, uh, the number of the name of the website to its IP address. 
Um, and it can also uh, include orders to payment processors like American Express and PayPal, MasterCard and Visa to cut off funds to those websites and also to advertising brokers to sever their relations with those, bro with those websites. All without a court order, without a trial, without due process. And it's not just the government. SOPA contains a misleading market-based provision that allows um, uh, private companies to exert the censorship pressure. You can send a, a list of the websites you don't like, if you're a big entertainment giant, to the same people, ISPs, payment providers, advertising brokers, and they too are required to expeditiously remove those relationships, remove those sites. Um, but there is no requirement that they allow the sites on the other side to object. There's no minimum number of days notice they have to give you before they take down your site. They can just remove it, and they must remove it. And what's more, it actually encourages payment processors not to wait for a complaint from the government or from industry, and to take steps on their own to sever relationships with firms and sites that they believe may generate complaints in the future. Um, SOPA also prohibits making tools that can be used to break out of this great firewall of America that it builds. And that um, potentially traps anyone making security tools to... Yep. Doesn't that mean that browser is illegal? Because I can put an IP address in browser bar? It's a good question. And you know, the question is, doesn't that make browsers illegal because you can put IP addresses in? It's funny because I just had a column about this in Publishers Weekly, and I made a point of putting the Pirate Bay's IP address in it to see if Publishers Weekly's website becomes illegal as a result of this law. We'll see. Um, it prohibits making these tools, and that means that if you make proxies to uh, help people secure their communications, or if you work on the integrity of the domain name system, a critical piece of internet infrastructure that has been under sustained attack for the past several years, and that puts us all at risk in our financial records and personal dealings, as well as our dealings with our government and military and so on, uh, puts them all at risk because all of those tools uh, subvert the goals of SOPA. Um, SOPA is the worst internet bill that America has seen, but it's not the only one. The Senate version of SOPA also contains a provision to send you to jail for up to five years if you, if you make a certain number of illegal streams um, on the internet. So, for example, one person who made more than enough illegal streams to go to jail for five years is Justin Bieber, who started his career by illegally uploading videos of himself singing old R&B songs to YouTube. Um, and of course, this includes posting videos of you and your friends singing copyrighted songs in your basement or using a copyrighted song as the soundtrack for your little fan video. We are ramping up this intermediary liability to unforeseen heights in the name of helping artists. But when you increase the liability, you create two choices for an intermediary. First, you can put all your customers at risk of random law enforcement blackouts by allowing people to upload stuff. Or you can say that the only people who get to upload stuff are the people who have enough money and influence to make sure that a lawyer will sign off and say that there's nothing bad here and we can, und we can indemnify you. We have intermediary law totally, absolutely backwards. With DRM, we hand intermediaries rights they neither need nor deserve. The right to overrule creators' decisions about how their copyrights should be used. With intermediary liability, we take away the critical intermediary right to host material without having to inspect it first or bear undue liability if it turns out to infringe copyright to the great detriment of creators who use those, li those intermediaries to reach their audience and make money from them. You could not do a worse job of designing copyright law to take care of creators if you tried. So that's law number two, and here's the end. Dr. O's third law. Information doesn't want to be free, people do. You doubtless heard this famous saying, information wants to be free, first uttered by Stuart Brand to Steve Wozniak at the inaugural Hackers Conference in Santa Cruz in 1984. I swear, every time someone says, says that, the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force kills a kitten. <laughs> because no one who fights for fair and reasonable information policy does so because information wants to be free. We do it because we want to be free. Not free to commit piracy, but free to own devices that don't let remote parties 
set policy on them that we don't want or know about or need. Free to use networks that don't spy on us just in case we're infringing copyright. Free to communicate in private without having to worry that our personal lives will be made public in the name of protecting copyright. Because DRM doesn't work. We don't know how to make the computer that runs all the programs except the program that pisses you off. And the closest we can come is to design the computer that spies on you all the time to see if it can figure out if you're doing something naughty and try and stop you. So the most famous example of this, of course, is Sony BMG, who released six million CDs loaded with a piece of malicious software called a rootkit that patched the operating system of your computer so that certain processes and files would be invisible to it. So that if it was running a program in the background that was watching what you did, and you said, computer, show me all the programs running, that program wouldn't show up. And if it had a file that contained that program, and you said, computer, show me all the files in this directory, that program wouldn't show up. Now, nominally, it was there to watch what you did in case you copied the music on the audio CD. But as soon as they punctured the immune system of your computer, parasites rushed in to fill the hole. Malicious software authors knew that people who were infected by Sony's rootkit could be infected with malware that could hide itself from the operating system using the same cloak that Sony's software was using. Now, uh, it's not just Sony. Game companies keep repeating this lunacy. You know, no doubt, about the 3DS, the little Nintendo 3D pocket device. Uh, I can't use them because um, I'm astigmatic. I, I can't converge 3D, I get a headache. But I'm told they're quite fun. Uh, but there's something that a lot of people don't know about them, which is that when you turn them on, they try to connect the internet, if you, even if you tell them not to. And when they connect to the internet, they check to see if there's a new version of their operating system, even if you tell them not to. And if they find one, they download it, even if you tell them not to. And when they've downloaded it, they install it, even if they tell them, you tell them not to. And if, when they install it, they detect that you have tampered with the old operating system to allow you to play games that weren't authorized by Nintendo, either because maybe you're a pirate, or maybe you wrote your own games, or maybe your friends wrote games for you. They shut down the device and it never works again. And on PCs, gamers have it even worse. Companies like Ubisoft take the position that when you play a game, your computer should belong to them. What it can do, what it can't do, what programs it can run should be at their discretion. And they're the most egregious offenders, but they're not the only ones. Everyone from Hulu to Amazon Unbox to iBooks are finding ways to take over your computer. And they demand that the operating system vendors and the hardware companies build in the hooks that allow processes to run without your permission, even if you don't want them there. So I'm a science fiction writer, and I go to science fiction movies, and I get angry. I get angry because they get paid more than I do, and because the movies are so often dumb. And the one thing that is the most dumb thing is what I call the self-destructing rocket ship. You've no doubt experienced this. You go to a science fiction movie, and there's some kind of uh, tussle on the bridge, and someone slips, and their elbow presses a button, and this very posh English voice, it sounds to my ear like Margaret Thatcher after accent training, starts counting down from 10. Self-destruct sequence initiated. Self-destructing in 10, 9, 8. And I always watch that and I think, you know, I'm not an aerospace engineer, but wouldn't that be a better rocket ship if it wasn't designed to explode? <laughs> And when I encounter devices that are designed this way, I think, wouldn't our devices be better devices if they weren't designed to be rooted so scumbags can watch what we do, control what we do, look at our stuff? Thank you. It's okay. on, on the intermediary side, you have companies like Viacom, which are embroiled in a lawsuit against Google for its YouTube service. They demand that the courts should take away the privacy flag on YouTube so that all videos have to be visible to everyone. You can't mark a video as visible only to you and your friends. Now they do, they want that because they want their copyright enforcement robots to be able to see all the video. But I use the privacy flag because I upload photos of uh, videos of my three-year-old in the bath for my parents to see. And I don't understand why my ability to conduct my private life in private should be subordinated to Viacom's desire to maximize its profits. Um, it gets worse in the UK, in France, in New Zealand. We've passed these internet disconnection laws that require internet service providers to disconnect whole families from the internet if someone who lives at that address is accused of infringing copyright. Now, the UN 
calls internet access a human right, and it's not hard to see why. Uh, my wife, before she quit her job uh, to start a 3D printing business, which is very cool, but not the subject of this talk, was um, Commissioner of Education at Channel 4, one of our public broadcasters in Britain. And um, she worked with government research on the effects of the internet on the poorest, most vulnerable families in the UK. These are people living in the kind of English Rust Belt, uh, places where the industry has collapsed, there's no jobs, and everyone lives in social housing. And they compared families that were as similar as they could get them, but one family had the internet and the other one didn't. And what they found is that when you give a family the internet, the outcomes are better in ways that you would never even expect. They have better nutrition. They have better grades, more social mobility, they have better jobs, they have more money in their pocket at the end of the month because they can pay their bills online. They have, uh, they have better civic engagement, better political knowledge. Um, in every way, their quality of lives are improved. And we're proposing to take away that single wire that delivers freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and freedom of the press, and all those other benefits from social mobility to better nutrition because you may live with someone who is accused of infringing copyright. Now, I don't think science fiction writers are very good at predicting the future, but there are two predictions that I'm willing to stand by. The first one is that bits are never, ever going to get harder to copy. This is it, here, 2011. This is as hard as it's ever going to be. Your grandchildren will marvel at how stupidly hard it was in 2011 to copy stuff. They will say, tell me again, Grandpa. Tell me again, Grandma. Was there really a time when you couldn't buy a drive the size of your thumbnail for five francs that held every word ever written, every song ever sung, every movie ever made, every painting ever painted, every photo ever taken? Tell me that it used to take time to copy things. Was there a time when all of human knowledge Knowledge wasn't accessible to everyone all the time. Um, so that's my first prediction. <laughs> my second one is that everything we do in the real world today involves the internet, and everything we do in the real world tomorrow will require the internet. Already, thanks to austerity, our local councils in London are shutting down their payment windows. So if you need to pay a fine or a fee, register your kid, or um, want to get a permit to put a shed on the side of your flat, you can only do that on the internet. When you take away the internet, you take away all of that. You and I and our children increasingly inhabit a world in which internet policy affects every single corner of our lives. And yes, the internet is involved in making copies, so on its face, copyright law looks like it should apply. But copyright law's remit is make us an orderly marketplace for selling creative goods, not create a single ER legislation that can govern every corner of human endeavor. And if it needs to do that, it will become nonsensical and be unfit for any purpose. Technology allowed revolutionaries in the Middle East last spring to coordinate in their challenges against despotic rulers, but technology also allowed the secret police in those countries to know who to round up who to, in, who to imprison, who to torture, and who to murder. If the furtherance of, furtherance of copyright requires making the job of the citizen harder and the job of the secret policeman easier, then we're doing copyright wrong. I'm a novelist, I pay my mortgage with copyright, I feed my family with copyright, and I believe, I really, really believe that we can find copyright solutions that pay artists without requiring ridiculous things like copy-proof bits or increased intermediary liability that builds the fa a surveillance state into the fabric of the information society. But I'll tell you what, if it turns out that I'm wrong, and the only way to keep science fiction writing alive is to redesign the devices that fill our pockets, that run our cars, that carry our love notes, and comprise our whole system of political and civic engagement so that they spy on us and betray us, then I'll get a real job. Because I love being a writer, but I want to be free more than I want to write. I want my daughter to be free, I want our countries to be free, and our future to be free. If you agree, I hope that you'll get involved. The groups who put on tonight's activity, uh, tonight's program, are all involved in this fight. You can talk about it at your job, you can talk about it with your politicians, you can join international organizations like the Electronic Frontier Foundation um, and Creative Commons. We can secure livelihoods for creative people and we can preserve technology's power to liberate. But we must put the arts back where they belong, on the side of free speech, free assembly, and freedom of conscience. Thank you. Mm -hmm.